Good morning. I trust you had a great Thanksgiving. Maybe ate a little bit too much, were able to be with family. Not everyone was able to be with family. Maybe you weren't. You know what? If we know the Lord, we all have so many reasons to give thanks to the Lord for, to praise Him, and to see the good in each day. And so I trust that you were able to then and are able to now. We're in the book of Revelation. It just reminds us that Jesus is the one that we can trust. We see Jesus bringing all things to completion here as He fulfills the will of His Father. And so as we come into the book of Revelation, we, uh, we encounter that. Jesus is transforming us. He's transforming all things, history, mankind, uh, conforming it to the will of God. There's three sections in the book of Revelation. The first one is in chapter 1. John writes about these things. What have you seen? Well, what he has seen is Jesus Christ is indeed transformed himself. From, from Jesus who was on the earth and walked with John and the disciples and ministered, Jesus now is vastly different in his glory, his essence, his nature. All these things he has revealed now in a fullness before John that John only saw a glimpse of at the Mount of Transfiguration, and, and, and that's about it. And then just saw, just saw God in Christ as the disciples served with him and walked with him. Now the experience and what he sees is vastly different as he sees Christ resurrected and before uh, in all of his glory. In chapter 2 and 3, the second section of Revelation, so he, John is writing about the things that are. What is taking place right now? Jesus is ministering to his church. It's in chapter 2 and 3. That's where we're at right now. And so we're picking it up. John is writing to seven specific letters to seven churches, specific churches, historical churches, but not only to those churches. They're going out to all of the churches that exist at that time and then ultimately to us, his church today. What we've seen so far are just some reminders and lessons. Uh, the first church that we encountered was Ephesus, and we're reminded there of, of the Lord's great love for us. He holds us and he dwells in our midst. His presence is with us always. And he calls us to, to, to keep our love fresh, to rekindle our love, not to lose our love for the Lord, to keep it in front of us every day, growing and multiplying and, and more a part of who we are every day. In the church of Smyrna, we saw this. Jesus is indeed our victory, a suffering church. He reminds them he is eternal, the first and the last. And yet at the same time, he overcame himself. He chose to step into history and overcome sin and death for you, for I, for mankind. And he calls us to be faithful. He calls us not to be afraid. In Pergamum, the third church that we saw, we see that Jesus is indeed our accountability. He's the one that we answer to. His truth, he is, he is the double-edged sword. His truth is our standard for living for life, for eternity, for all that we do. And so he reminds us from this church not to tolerate compromise. He addresses the specific need in each church. That's what he does. With all seven churches, this is what he does. The first thing that he does, there is a specific church. This specific church is Thyatira. We're in the fourth church today. We're making the circle around this Roman road, this main road that went through Asia Minor. We are encountering now this fourth church. We are in chapter 2, verses 18 through 28. And we see this about Jesus. He is just. He is right. And uh, so we're going to encounter that in the text this morning. Thyatira Tyre itself, as we look at it, it was a military outpost. It's been occupied with troops since Alexander the Great was there. It stands as a post near Pergamum and Pergamus and to guard. Uh, it was a commercial center, had many trade guilds. We would call those, what, uh, unions today, apprentices. You, as you stepped into a trade, you walked up and, and went up through this guild. And so everything that they did, you were a part of. If you were going to succeed, you had to, you had to be a part of that guild and do everything that they did. Very much a part of that scene, the guild scene often was, uh, were uh, meals and, and worship to, I to idols and those kind of things. And so, and so uh, it was, it was um, a, a very difficult thing for a believer to maneuver and to walk through and still honor the Lord. Uh, the city had a temple to Apollo, who was the son of Zeus. And so, and so that's going to be significant here as we, as we look at uh, this text today as well. Jesus does an assessment of each church. As he looks specifically at each church, he assesses that church. Same thing that he does as he looks into our lives, he's doing here for the church. He says, I know. We encounter, we encounter that here in verse 19. I know. It's, he's showing, he's displaying his omniscience and his work. What does he know about uh, Thyatira? What does he know about this specific church? What's important to him as he looks at this church? 
What's important to him as he looks at your life and my life? Because that's what he's doing. Well, let's look at the church here. He sees here in, uh, in verse 19. Let's read it together. I know your works, your love, your faith, your service, your patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. He says this, um, I know your works. That's, that's the whole picture, the big picture. The works are, are, are everything that defines how we walk, how we breathe, what we do every day. It's what we do. It's what's important to us. It's our priorities. It's the choices that we make. And as he looks into this church, he says, I know all about you. I know what's important to you. I know what you have emphasized. I know what you're following through on. I know what you're doing, what you're not doing. I know your work. I know your love. Uh, the very first quality he highlights here is the love of this church. This is a church that is, is known, is defined by a genuine love relationship with Christ. Jesus affirms them for that. This is his words into their life, into their church. I know you love me. I see it. It's there. You are faithful in your love. You're growing in your love to me. It is genuine. Your relationship is genuine before me. I know your faith. You, you trust the Lord deeply every day. You walk before the Lord. You say, Lord, I trust you today. And you act accordingly. Your faith is growing. It is deep. Your service. Your service, your love to others. Your, your love for me is put into action because you are serving me. You are serving others. And that's, that's what he calls us to do, to, to be faithful in loving him, loving others, to be to be faithful in our walk, to trust Him every day, to serve Him. That word, that word uh, service is uh, diakonia. That's the word that we get for a deacon. That word is used more often in the role of, of servants in general, only a few times in the, in the actual role of the office of deacon. But it's significant, diakonia. And so we see here that uh, they are servants of the Lord. They're faithful in serving. Uh, they're doing it with hearts that, that uh, are that love the Lord and doing it with the right heart and attitude. He says, I know your patient endurance. You're staying to the stuff. You're tireless. Uh, it's not been easy. And yet, and yet you continue to faithfully walk down this path and tirelessly to endure in following Jesus Christ and being a disciple of Christ. And then he says here, he says, your, your work is, is, um, exceeds the first. Your latter work exceeds the first. In other words, it's growing. Um, there is, there is faithful growth in your life. You're constantly improving. You're constantly changing. You're constantly conforming to Christ. You're constantly seeing, allowing me to continue to change who you are and to make me like you. These are real positives. As he looks into the church, he sees people who, who have a genuine connection with him, a genuine relationship with him, uh, who, are, who are striving to live for the Lord, who are striving uh, to do the right thing, to love him, and uh, to honor him and to be that be that testimony. As we continue on in this church, as he does most of these seven churches, he then highlights he then highlights a need that they have. Here's a negative. Here's a negative. He says, "But you are defined by love. It is defines you, but you also tolerate Jezebel." This is in verse 20 and 21. I have this against you that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality to eat food sacrificed to idols I gave her time to repent but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality he looks into this church and he sees a problem here he sees compromise here there is this lady she is a prophetess she considers herself to be a prophet that's how she functions she's she's uh, emphasizing false doctrine false teaching in the life of the church she is deceptive she is pulling people away from faithfulness to the Lord from from fidelity to the Lord uh, from integrity in their walk before the Lord she is drawing them into into temple worship and, and all that's a part of that sexual immorality that's often very much a part of that idolatry where Christ is now, uh, mixed with other gods that are being brought into their into their life, other uh, other um, allegiances in their life, and she's she's communicating to them that's okay. You can serve God, and you can also be you can also be a part of the culture. You can serve God and and still have these things in the culture and 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 be recognized by the culture as one of them. God says that can't take place in the life of a believer, and there is a refusal to repent. God has, has 
sought to speak to her own heart specifically, and she has refused to turn to the Lord and make it right. Uh, he says in verse 24, he reminds us here, um, she is involved in what some call the deep things of Satan. They are involved in, in a road that is pulling them from Christ, and so because that's true, it is satanic in its origin. It's not always witchcraft and all those things, which it, it is here, there's false gods, but it but anything that, it, that pulls me away from Christ is of Satan. It is, it is of him. It's his desire to pull me away from God. So, But they have pursued this path. There are some in the church who have pursued this path of following after learning more about Satan and his, and his path. And so he says punishment is coming. Um, the question is, is this lady here, is, she, is that her literal name? Is she called Jezebel? Is it symbolic? Some would say, well, it's symbolic of this, the Babylonian system, the uh, Babylon from the Tower of Babel all the way to Revelation 17 where it's destroyed. And so she's representative of that. Others would say it's a pseudonym. It's, it's a given name to her to represent her because of how her life is. This name represents her. Uh, that name, Jezebel, carries with it the connotation really that Judas does. We don't know anybody. Do you know anybody whose name is Judas? I don't. Jezebel would have been another one of those names. So is it a literal name? It may be. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's likely that it's not. Maybe it's a lady who represents who she was all about. That takes us, that takes us to uh, 1 Kings. There's a number of chapters here in 1 Kings. Specifically, this verse pulls out that what takes place. There was none who sold himself to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord, like Ahab, like King Ahab. He was a wicked king whom Jezebel, his wife, incited. She was the power behind his evil. She was the one who motivated, incited, uh, flamed his evil. She was the one who was the was the wisdom behind his evil. She was the one who was the instigator behind his evil. He was evil. She was more so. Everything about Jezebel was evil in every way. This this real specific woman, historical woman in the time of Israel. You can go back. You can look at that. But the Jezebel in this church represents the truth of that reality. She is influencing people away from the Lord doing it specifically, knowingly, and not repenting. Another element that comes up as he speaks to them is the element of love. You love me, you do it. Uh, Ephesians 4.15 reminds us that we are to speak, we're to practice, we're to exhibit truth, but in love. And so the, so the, um, the dynamic that's going on here is we remember Ephesus. Ephesus was faithful in dealing with false teachers, refuting false teachers, but they had lost their first love. Thyatira is is loving the Lord faithfully, but they have they have lost the commitment to address to refute falseness in their life in their church worldviews. They've accepted those worldviews. They've accepted that influence into their church. They themselves are not following this path. Many of them, but they have accepted it, and so it needs to be dealt with. It needs to be dealt with. Um, and so the Lord just reminds us that when we are committed to truth, but we don't love. When we are committed to loving Him, but are committed to truth, God hates both of those things. So we need that balance in our life. We are reminded by Paul in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we're to pursue the things of the Spirit, not the deep things of Satan here. Her work was defined by the work of Satan. And they were pursuing that with all their heart. This group was in the church. That's not to be, that's not to be true of a genuine believer. Your life or mine. We're to pursue the things of the Spirit for our life. We impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, the mystery of God. These things God's revealed to us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the deep things of God. We are to always be listening to the, to the work of the Spirit. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. That's over and over again with each of these churches. We're to be listening to the work of the Spirit. And so we receive from the Spirit what God is doing that we might understand. God gives us the Spirit so we can understand the work of God in our life. The response to that is here. If you look, if you look at the text in verse 20, it says, uh, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel. She calls herself a prophetess and is teaching, and she's seducing my servants. The word there is doulos, my slaves, my servants. That's us. That's all of us who are children of God. She is affecting my servants. That's a big deal. Romans chapter 12, we belong to God. He calls us to be a living sacrifice to Him. Lord, He is our shepherd. He is our teacher. He is our master. We're to follow Him in everything and everything. Every day we wake up, we make a choice. 
Are we, is he going to be the one who has the allegiance for our day, the priorities for the day? Are all of our priorities going to be committed to his will? Or are we going to pursue what we want to do, what we think is right, what feels good to us? Every day it's a spiritual battle. Every day we wake up and say, who will I, who will I give my allegiance to today? Who will I follow? Who will I allow to direct my choices, to control my choices, my motivations, and all that I do today? And so we wake up and we need to pray and talk to the Lord and, and ask that He would help us to yield each day to Him and that we would serve Him fully. We're to serve from an attitude of gratitude. Only fear the Lord, serve Him faithfully with all your heart, for consider, folks, just consider, think about, dwell upon, meditate upon all the things that God has done for you. Consider all the things that God has done for you. Folks, that's motivation. It's motivation in my heart to keep me where I need to be. It's motivation in your heart to keep you where you need to be. And then he says, here's the path that you need to take. Here's the path. So he, in each church, he designates a path for them to follow. And he says from verse 25, he reminds them, hold fast. He says, hold fast. Only hold fast what you have until I come. Hold fast what you have and do it until I come. Do it until I come. In other words, do it the rest of your life. Do it all the way to the end. I am coming back in. He didn't come in the life of this church. He hasn't come yet, but he is coming. He says, be faithful until he comes. He may come today. He may come right now. He says, be faithful until he comes. Hold fast. Stay to the stuff. Psalm 119, teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. That's what he's talking about right there. That the Word of God would influence me, it would conform me to Christ, and that I would keep those principles, keep that commitment to the very end. That the Lord would be the one who has my heart all the way to the very end. He wants your heart as well. The motivation is he's coming back. While we finish every we finished every service with this in Revelation. It fits right here. He's coming back. That's the motivation. He's coming. He's coming again. And I trust that's a, such an encouragement to you that every day you wake up, you say, Lord, I'm going to serve you today because I know, I know you're coming back and I want to be ready. I want to, I want to, what I'm doing today, if you come right now, I want your stamp to be on it. I want it to be pleasing to you. He also says as he assesses them, he puts them on this path. He says, I'm, not, I'm going to give you no other burdens. No other, he has no other steps for them to take. No other corrections for them to take. Um, be faithful. Deal with this group. Deal with this sin. But I'm not going to lay any other obligation upon you. What you're doing, you're doing well. Be committed to truth. Be committed to a biblical worldview. Address what's going on in your church, but continue what you're doing. Because what you're doing honors me. You know, all of us always need to be adjusting in our life. These churches remind us we always constantly need to be adjusting our life to the Lord's will. We always need to be bringing it back into conformity to the Lord's will. When we're out of harmony, bringing it back into harmony with the Lord's will. That's what he's talking about. I do not lay on you any other burden. To those who do not hold, to the, or to those who hold to these teachings, okay? That's what he says. Not, it's, he says, I don't give you any burden. To you who are holding my teaching, I put that on them wrong, okay? He enables strength for the call. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I'm gentle. I'm lowly in heart. In other words, I'm, I'm humble. And you'll find rest for your soul. For my, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I will enable you. I will carry that burden with you. It is, it is perfectly fit and tailored for you. What God calls you to do, the cost he asks you and I to pay, it is tailor fit to his enablement in our life. It's tailor fit to how he's made us, how he's wired us. God never brings anything into our life that isn't tailor-made in such a way that he will give us the ability to walk through that, to be strong in that. When we reach the end of ourselves, then he brings us to the place where we fully rely on God. That's what we saw last week. And then he speaks to his divine enablement. He promises to enable all of this in our lives, in each church. A reminder to us, it is the Holy Spirit that is that power, that enablement. He lives in your heart. He permanently indwells in your heart. He lives there by the power of the promise of God. He is your eternal security. And Revelation reminds us to be listening to the work of the Holy Spirit as He takes the Word of God and He touches your life. Listen as individuals. Listen as a church collectively. Keep it and obey it. And then Jesus Christ is indeed our enablement. We see it in two ways with each church here. 
We see it in his character. He says in verse 18, To the angel of the church of Thyatira write the words of the Son of God. By his very nature, he is God. He is the Son of God. That's significant in the culture of Asia Minor. It's significant here in the culture of this town. This word is mentioned nine times by John in the Gospel of John. It's mentioned seven times he, that Jesus is the Son of God. It's mentioned seven times in 1 John. It's mentioned only one time. This title is used nowhere else in the book of Revelation. Yes, he is the Son of God. There are a multitude of and many titles given to Christ here in Revelation. But this is the only place that this title is used for him. It's significant because, because it ties in specifically to this city, this town that the believers are living in. For, for the leader here, this temple, this temple of Apollo, is, is giving worship to a son of a god, Zeus. And Jesus Christ makes the distinction to say, he might be the son of a small g, God, and the emperor may claim to be a son of God, a small g, but I am the son of God. I am deity. I am the God above all gods, Lord above all lords, king above all kings. That's what he's doing here. He is deity. Hebrews 1 reminds us of that. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. He is the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the power of his word. And so what he does here is he reminds them, he says, I'm the Son of God. I can and I will do in your life what is necessary. He is all discerning. He is all discerning. His eyes are like a flame of fire. Verse 18. Like a flame of fire. He says, I have this against you. So he's showing his discernment there. I am he who searches your heart and, and your mind. His discernment, his omniscience, he's displaying there. I will give to each of you according to your ways. Verse 23. And so what he's showing us here is his omniscience, his discernment. He's, he is showing uh, his ability to see into every area of our life. And he will hold us accountable to that. We saw that last week. At the second coming of the Lord, this is the, the description we have of Christ. His eyes are like a flame of fire. He will see and reveal all things in full authority and in justice. And that leads us to our next point. He is authority. He is strength. Uh, here in verse 18, whose feet are like burnished bronze. We saw that in chapter 1, verse 15. Uh, that's what we see here. I will throw down. I will strike you. He will rule them. That's authority. Verse 22, 23, 27. That's what he says here. That's what he shows us. His, his authority, his strength. Again, we go back to Daniel. A description of one who met with Daniel, we believe, is Jesus Christ here. He is also... We see this description of him. His arms, his legs are like the gleam of burnished bronze. It is to communicate strength. It is to communicate power and authority. That's what we see here. He is worthy and able. We are reminded that all authority has been given to Jesus Christ. Um, that's who he is in this picture right here. Psalm chapter 2, verse 9. Prophetic word that's being fulfilled here in Revelation. In this passage and here in the book of Revelation. You shall break them. With a rod of iron, you shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Those who are evil, sin against you, wickedness, the evil system of this world, you will break it completely. Another, another. Uh, so those, these are character qualities of Christ. This is what we see coming through. It reminds us that these are enablements in our life. They help us to see ourselves, to understand who we are, to accept and to receive his look into our life, to acknowledge his power for obedience, his power for faithfulness, we look to Christ. We always look to His character. We are reminded that He is the one who enables in our life to do what we can do. He also makes a promise to each of these churches. And the promises of God, how significant they are for you and I this morning. He says, I will judge sin. Wow, that stops us short a little bit. I will judge sin. Verse 22 and 23. Let's uh, look at that together. Behold, I will throw her, Jezebel, onto a sickbed. And those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into a great tribulation, unless they repent of their works. And I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am, I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each one of you according to his works. We just see the judgment he has here. Uh, unless they repent, God will judge them. Sickness, um, because of their spiritual adultery, their physical adultery against God, uh, I will strike her children dead. 
Maybe she has children. They may, they, that may be part of the consequence here. It could be her children being her students, those who are under her teaching, who are her, as it were, disciples. I will strike them dead. I will strike dead this work. I will destroy this work and the life of the church. It won't continue. It won't exist. He's going to deal with it here. That's what he's saying. That's what he's promising. That's what God does. He deals with those things in our life. It hurts. He calls her to repentance. She refuses. Repentance hurts. Repentance is healing. Repentance is salve to our wound. Repentance is, is a turning back to the Lord. Repentance is receiving love. Punishment is meant to draw us back to love, back to grace. She refuses to do that. If you and I have sin in our life and we hold on to it, God will deal with that in our life. But he deals with that in love. You will deal with that in such a way that it hurts. You will deal with that in such a way that if I if I continually defy him and, and I'm not a testimony to his name, he will deal with that in my life. But he seeks to draw me back to him with that with that step of repentance so that I would receive that healing and that love and serve him faithfully again. He will judge sin. And so we saw the different elements here and how that is done. Um, John chapter 5, the father judges no one. He's given judgment to the son. Acts chapter 10, it's appointed by God that all will come under judgment. As Christ, he will judge the living and the dead. He dispenses justice here. Verse 23, look at this. Verse 23b, um, he searches the mind. I will give to each one of you according to your works, but to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching. So he makes, he makes a distinction there. He makes a distinction. He's going to bring justice. He's going to bring justice to those who are, who are in rebellion to him. He's going to bring justice to those who are walking in faithfulness to him. God is just. He is right. He will do the right thing here. That's what he promises here. That's what he promises in this text. Colossians 2 reminds us the wrongdoer will be paid back and without partiality. God doesn't favor us. God deals with our life because he loves us, but without partiality. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of, a, of the living God. Uh, God is holy. When he deals with our life, it is a fearful thing. Yet, the other side of that coin is when he deals with our life and we're walking with the Lord, it is a time of blessing. Both are taking place here. He's dealing with those who are following Jezebel. He's dealing with those who are faithful to him. It reminds us that sin can be for, forgiven. Her sin, your sin, my sin. It's we are made right through Jesus Christ. That's what we're promised here. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and He's just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is just, right. He is just and He is right. He will always do the right thing. And when He does the right thing, it will make us, it will make you into a position of being right with God. That's what He does. He cleanses us, He washes us. So I like this next element here because in justice he's dealing with the sin here. He's going to punish this group, Jezebel. He's going to punish sin. He does that. But please note this and be encouraged. Please note this as well. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. God is not unjust so as to overlook your love, your, I mean your work, and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. When God looks into the life of a believer who is faithful, He is just to honor that faithfulness. He is just to bless that faithfulness. He is just to never forget that faithfulness to Him. Justice isn't just the, the punishment of God. Justice is the reward and favor of God as well. That's what's taking place. That's His promise to you and I. That's His promise. Another promise He makes here is in verse 25, 6 and 7. The one who conquers and will keep my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron, as when the earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as myself have received authority from the Father. That's a promise he makes. He will give authority to his children. That's what he promises right here in this verse, in these verses. To those who hold fast, to those who are faithful. The church here is, that's how he is defining them. That's the quality he sees in them. They are indeed faithful to him. He says, you will be rewarded for that. To the one who overcomes, that's all of us. When we are faithful, when we overcome, we choose to, to do the right thing, to follow him, we are overcoming. 
to him who keeps my work to the very end, my works, all that God calls us to do, the call of God in our life, the steps of obedience, when we follow that faithfully, God will honor that. I will give authority over the nations. That's his promise here. That's, we see that prophetically, prophetically in, in Psalm 2. I will make the, the Father says, I will make the nations your heritage, Jesus, your possession, you shall break them. This, pot, this prophecy is now being fulfilled. It is a promise to us believers, Revelation 1. Jesus made us a kingdom, priests to his God. Revelation 26, we as believers, we will reign with him for a thousand years. That's the authority, that's the privilege, that's the opportunity that's being given to believers who walk faithfully. And then, and then he gives to us the, the promise of his presence, the promise of privilege that we have in him. We see this uh, at the end. And I will, verse 28, I will give him the morning star. What is the morning star? I will give him the morning star. What is that? I will give it to the one who conquers. And so what is it? Well, in Revelation 22, we see this. I, Jesus, as he finishes up this revelation, I am the root and the descendant of David. I am the morning star. I am the one who has brought ultimate victory. I am the glory of God. I am the light of the world. I am the one who, who shines across the sky when there was evil, and now there, is, now there is light and righteousness. I am the one who has fulfilled all things. It's prophesied out of numbers we see this. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall rise out of Jacob, not just the Bethlehem star, but this star, Jesus Christ, the morning star, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It, he, from a humble beginning, we see here a shoot from the stump of Jesse comes the power, the significance, the, the ultimate authority, rule, and reign of this morning star of Jesus Christ. It's reflected in us, his children, but the path of righteousness is like the light of the dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. When we, when we honor the Lord and we're faithful to him, the light of Christ is coming through in our life. We, we are exhibiting some of the, the glory of God, that morning star glory. We are exhibiting that. We're exhibiting Christ in our life. Our testimony is shining. We are, we are a light in a dark world. Daniel himself speaks to this. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. That's his promise. I will give you the morning star. I'm going to give you my presence, authority, privilege to rule and to reign in the, in the Millennial kingdom and beyond. I will give you the very delight of being in the presence of God. Folks, that's what heaven is all about. To be in the very presence of God. The presence of His glory. We close with a, with a, a, a reality check for all of us. Because in this text are two elements that give us a reality check today. As we, to just consider, to examine our life, to think about, to respond to, to say, where am I? Where is my life? What is coming from my life? Romans chapter 2 says, He will reward each of one of us according to his works. Again, I'll just say this. We're not saved by works. The work is our body of work. It's, it's how we live our life. It is reflective, reflective of whether we are a child of God or not a child of God. Those works don't save us. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of works, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God. It is His work in our life. And so works do not save us, but works define us. Works exhibit whether we are indeed a child of God or not. He says, I, I will reward each one of you according to your works. Eternal life to those who by perseverance in good works, that would be obedience, faithfulness, seek glory and honor and immortality, God's glory, God's honor and live in view of eternity and live in don't live for the here and now live in view of eternity I will reward you for that faithfulness with eternal life and all that's been presented here but wrath and anger to those who live in selfish ambition and do not obey the truth but follow unrighteousness if I'm following selfish ambition in my life then I'm not right with God if I'm not obeying the word of God and its truth then I'm not right with God because I'm not right with God, no one can enter into heaven who's not right with God. Yes, we sin, but we confess that as children of God. Positionally, we are right with God because we have exhibited, we have confessed faith in Jesus Christ for our life and for all eternity. We've confessed our sin and been 
made right and made whole. This morning, you're either in one place or the other. You may be in church, but church doesn't define what place you're in. You may be in the Bible. You may be doing Christian things, but that doesn't define which one of these positions you're in. Your life, your obedience, the character of your heart defines which position you're in. Not what people see around you, but what God sees. What does he see in my heart? What does he see in your heart? What does he see in my life? What does he see in your life? May God impress upon us by the work of his spirit that we need to be right with God. We need to be children who are following after Christ and doing it faithfully. That is affirmation of relationship. Lord, this morning, work in our heart and our life. Take us to where we need to be. May we examine ourselves honestly before your word and find ourselves with confidence and joy to be a child of God. Lord, if you bring us to repentance and bring us uh, back into righteousness, that's exactly what you desire to accomplish. But Lord, do your work and may we listen and may we respond. May we have that confidence right now that we are children of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us. We invite you to come back next week. We're excited. Oh, by the way, we have missionaries coming this next week. You're going to want to be here. Um, missionaries that we support, we are there sending church. We're looking forward to that. And uh, so we invite you to come if you're able to come. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.